Good morning, everyone. Please stand, and we'll have an opening prayer. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. O Spirit, teach us to pray with deep concentration and to imbue scientific meditation with devotion. May our hearts daily become more pure by all surrendering love for Thee. Om. Peace. Amen. Please be seated. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today we're going to talk about uh, attention and concentration. And as we all know, these are topics of fundamental importance on the spiritual path. And so we're going to talk about what our guru says about them. But I'm also going to have uh, some frequent references, actually, to the, to the science of attention and concentration as understood. Uh, nowadays, some great strides have been made in this area in the last 20 years. And uh, I, I think this, this has something that, that, that will shed a, a helpful perspective on what we're trying to do in our spiritual lives, and in, particularly, in particular when we try to concentrate and meditate. And we're going to look at uh, what we can do maybe to support our efforts in meditation and, and concentration. But of course, we always begin with a period of chanting and meditation, so let's do that now. So, sitting in the meditation posture with spine erect, eyes lifted to the Christ center, Relax the body, relax the mind. We're going to chant, Today my mind has dived deep in thee, for thy pearls of love. Emphasizing that to really feel God's love, to it, have that wonderful relationship with God in a very real and tangible way. We first need to dive deep in the ocean of God's presence through concentration. And then in the short period of meditation following the chant, if you have the Hong So technique of concentration, practice that. And if you don't, just watch the breath Watch it come in and go out. And in particular, if the mind wanders, when the mind wanders, take a, a, a quick mental note. Why did it wander? Perhaps we're in something of a, maybe a mood that has us not on point as much as we'd like to be. Or maybe you are feeling particularly stressed by some things going on in our lives. Or maybe even threatened by something, something maybe going on in the world, wherever it is. And, and it's just preoccupying our mind. So make a note about that, but, but bring the mind back to watch the breath again. And if that happens more than once or a few times each time, ask yourself, but why? Why is there a reason for why my mind is wandering? And of course, this is not part of the Hong So technique. 
practicing Aung So, we just bring the mind back to the breath when we notice it's wandered. But this is a special practice today because we're going to try and get a, a sense of what are the things that are disturbing my efforts at concentration. But first the chant. has dived deep in thee today my mind has dived deep in thee for thy pearls of love from thy depthless sea for thy pearls of love from thy depthless sea today my mind has dived deep in thee if I find not I will not blame thy sea, I will find fault with my diving, I will find fault with my diving. Today my mind has dived deep in thee, today my mind has dived deep in thee, for thy pearls of love from thy depthless sea, for thy pearls of love, from thy depthless sea. Today my mind has dived deep in thee. If I find not, I will not blame thy sea. I will find fault with my diving. I will find fault with my diving today my mind has dived deep in thee today my mind has dived deep in thee for thy pearls of love from thy deathless sea for thy pearls of love from thy deathless sea today my mind has dived deep in thee if I find not I will not blame thy sea I will find fault with my diving I will find fault with my diving I will find fault with my diving
Good morning. So I, was, uh, I became a, a monk in the, in the mid-90s. I was a postulant for two years in our ashram in Encinitas. And I found out pretty quickly that uh, the monastic order puts a high premium on everybody paying attention to what we're supposed to do in all things, but in particular in meditation. And of course, our guru talks about this uh, a lot. And so in the middle of my stay in Encinitas, we published uh, for the first time our guru's commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, God Talks with Arjuna. And I was really fascinated uh, by many things in this book. But one thing that really stood out to me, because I had never really given it any thought at all, was how our guru drew parallels and correspondences between certain spiritual qualities, psychological qualities, with certain parts of the brain and, and the spinal cord. And this really fascinated me. And, and I wondered what parts of the brain were associated with attention. And after I left the Postulant Ashram and, and came up to Mount Washington, I would keep an eye on the literature about attention over the years. But I always found it very unsatisfying. Maybe it was what I was finding, but I, you know, I really couldn't see how it applied to what we try to do when we sit down to meditate. You know, keep the mind on one object of thought, and when the mind wanders away, bring it back. Uh, you know, up to the 90s, at least, it seemed like a lot of the studies on attention had to do with what was going on in the outer world, different things coming into different ears, different things on a radar screen, and what have you. But, but the science has progressed tremendously in the years since then. And I think it's now at a point where it has something, some very interesting things to tell us and support why our guru tells us to live our lives in a certain way, have certain habits, because these all support our efforts to concentrate. So I first want to take a moment, though, to, to discuss the purpose of concentration, because it's not an end in itself. In Lesson 21, Mastering the Power of Concentrated Attention, our guru says that if all a spiritual seeker does is try to sit in the silence and tries to stop their thoughts by a process of distraction, all they get is an occasional glimpse of peace, such that they begin to wonder, is this all there is to God and His inspiration? And that pretty soon after they might find themselves belittling or growing indifferent to the short-lived, this is again quoting our guru, to the short-lived inner experiences fleetingly glimpsed during periods of silence. And we don't want to suffer the same fate, do we? I mean, this is why I think when we read the autobiography of a yogi, we were so attracted to this idea that there's a science of concentration, a science of meditation. It's not all about just be a good boy or girl and then you go to heaven. I mean, it's, you know, we can really, we have something to say about this. So the real ex for the real experience of God, we need to understand how the mind and attention really work and we need a technique. And this is why, our master said, and again, this is from Lesson 21, this is why India's great masters of yoga train their students in the definite art of freeing the attention from distractions and directing it toward God before asking them to love him. So that's why we focus on concentration. It's not an end in itself, although it's very helpful for everything in, uh, that we do in life, as we all know. But in particular, it's necessary if we're going to really meditate deeply. So concentration. Let's have a definition. And again, this is from Lesson 21. Our Master wrote, Scientific concentration means to gather all the attention to a center by cutting off attention from its entanglements. It's a great word. Cutting off attention from its entanglements in outer objects of senses and the thoughts they arouse. So, since concentration has to do, first and foremost, with the attention in some way, the first thing we need to understand is what attention is. And really, I should say, I know it's grammatically incorrect, but I really should say what attentions are. You'll forgive the grammar. Because 
there is more than one system of attention uh, in the brain. And we know this now very clearly. And each has a specific purpose, and they are supported perhaps by, uh, by different or perhaps overlapping parts and networks in the brain. And the system that is particularly relevant to our efforts to concentrate is what is called the executive function or executive control. It has different names. And it, it is the strength of that attention system in particular that determines how fast we notice that our minds are wandering away from our focus on the breath during Hong So. An ability that nowadays is sometimes called meta-awareness, which means awareness of our awareness, or oftentimes awareness of our unawareness, you know, whichever, <laughs> whichever is most appropriate. But it is that system in particular that we strengthen when we practice Hong So effectively. Amishi Jha is a professor of psychology and director of contemplative neuroscience, there's a thing, contemplative neuroscience at the University of Miami. And in her book, Peak Mind, which just came out uh, in October of 2021, she highlights the importance of a particular part of the prefrontal cortex. We've all heard of this, this first part, the front part of the uh, cerebral cortex. She highlighted the importance of a particular part of this prefrontal cortex as a keynote in the network that facilitates this meta-awareness. And it's called, the, it's a mouthful, but the rostrolateral prefrontal cortex. And uh, in the book, she didn't describe exactly where that is, so I took to the internet to find out, and uh, I was really astonished. Well, not so astonished, but it was really interesting nonetheless to find out where do you think it is. It's like right here at the front of the brain, but like not up there or the side or anything, it's right behind here. Now, I don't want to make too much of that, it's, it's, but it's an interesting thing nonetheless. And I also found it remarkable that this part of the prefrontal cortex is also involved in social connection. And Joe says it's activated when we are meta-aware and also when we connect with others by simulating their reality and seeing things from their point of view. So we could all do with more of that in the world. But you know, you can see why our guru says, concentrate first and then we'll feel love for God. But also, we'll feel greater connection with our fellow human beings. And I also thought it was interesting that it, it shed an additional light on the, the name our guru gave his organization, Self-Realization Fellowship. You know, they're both very, very tied together with the spiritual eye, if you like, very, very closely related. So I've talked about the executive uh, function or the executive control. Uh, what are the other attention systems? These are the alerting system and the orienting system. And basically the alerting system is activated, well, you can guess whenever we're alerted that there is something in the environment that we need to pay attention to, perhaps. And the orienting system then helps us to focus on one specific thing at a time, that one specific thing that we have determined needs our attention. And, and again, these are different systems in the brain. They're maybe overlapping to some degree, but they're different. And here's an important point. Our attention tends to operate in just one of these modes at any given time. And if our environment, which is our outer environment or our inner environment, is constantly telling us there could be a problem, pay attention, then our efforts at concentration are continually hijacked, and that's a term, attentional hijacking. Or in Master's word, entangled, as he says, entangled in outer objects of senses and the thoughts they arouse. And you can see how this plays out in the story of Madame Butterfly in Lesson 4. Madame, as we know, is constantly and continually distracted by ringing bells, sensations of all sorts coming in, thoughts that are aroused by those sensations, and then memories that are aroused by those particular, particular thoughts. And of course she gets frustrated and upset. And is it any wonder she can't concentrate? 
Clearly, what Madam needs to do is get busy and take advantage of her brain's innate neuroplasticity and strengthen her executive function. So that's, that's what she needs to do. And, you know, Madam Butterfly, she had it easy. Her grandson, uh, Mr. Butterfly, is having a much harder time of it. He has to battle the temptations of smartphones, social media, insufficient sleep, ultra-processed foods, supersized caffeine drinks, and other attention-destroying dangers seemingly omnipresent in the modern world. <laughs> and so many of these are new in historical terms. They're, 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 ver they're very new. And uh, Johan Hari's recent book, Stolen Focus, is a sobering account of these many factors. Some of them didn't even exist 15 years ago. And others that did exist have gotten way worse. And so it seems like, you know, we have a pandemic, if you like, of inattention today. And it's a very, it's a very serious one, too. And all of these many factors, including the, the two that I want to focus on in particular today, because I think uh, both that they have a surprisingly big effect on our attention, and those, those are sleep and diet, they can be grouped, all these factors can be grouped in three major categories. And these are the categories that I suggested might have uh, provoked your mind into wandering in the exercise at the beginning uh, of, our, of our service today. Stress, poor mood, and threat. So these are the big three when it comes to things that really try to uh, distract us when we sit to meditate. And I find this categorization actually very useful because it explains why our guru spent so much time telling us how we could deal with our moods and live fearlessly in a sometimes threatening world. And although he didn't talk about stress per se, because that concept really only became um, prominent, you'd say, in, in the 1950s, he did say about nervousness, which he talked about a lot, and I think you know, you can look at nervousness in different ways in relation to these three categories, but for now, let's just think of it as perhaps the result of uncontrolled stress and hypervigilance. But Matt Urguru said about nervousness, if you are nervous, you cannot concentrate, and you cannot meditate deeply to find peace and wisdom. Shaw acknowledges, of course, that these three categories are related and intertwined but they're also subtler and more insidious than appears at a glance. For example, stress. We actually don't have to feel stressed in our minds to, to be stressed physiologically. We may be juggling a lot of things and loving it. And, you know, would you want a life that didn't challenge you in certain ways? But nevertheless, nevertheless it these things that we're trying to juggle, just living our lives, Physiologically, they're stressful to the system. But whether we enjoy the stress or not, it can have much the same effect on the attention system, especially if this stress goes on a long time, which for many people, unfortunately, it does. And as for moods, they tend to create loops of negative thought, which go round and round in the mind, and they're hard to break free of. And so we can't concentrate on something else. And in studies, people that have been manip, manip, I always laugh at uh, what researchers do to, to subjects and studies, but you can manipulate people into a poor mood and then test their attention by showing them uh, disturbing photographs. And uh, this will create a, a, a bad mood, understandably, and then their performance on the attention test will plummet. One of our monks told me, he was in Sri Dayamata's office one time with another monk, when Ma said to this other monk, he was keen to emphasize that, uh, you, have a, you have a dark mood around you. You have a dark cloud about you. And he replied, I just can't get rid of this mood I'm in. And Ma said, you had better. You are throwing a wet blanket over everyone you meet and everything you are doing. We have work to do. Moods, and here's what she, how she explained it, moods shut down the creative forces. Work becomes distracted, and meditation is almost impossible. Everything just becomes a focus on self. 
And Ma said, what do we do about it? Just throw the mood out. <laughs> she said, it's not hard. Just focus on the wonderful things you're doing in your life for God and Guru. The mood will float away like unwanted smoke. We at least have to have that attitude when we're, when we're trying to work with our moods. They might not, it might not go away right away, but we at least have to start with that attitude. And there are other things we can do, sure. But being aware of just how, what a detrimental effect it has on our ability to meditate is, 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 a, good, is a good start. And finally, threat. When we're threatened or feel threatened, attention is reconfigured in two ways. And again, this is uh, from Professor Jaw. She says, our vigilance to threat increases, so, so our alerting system is on, is on full alert. And secondly, our attention becomes stimulus-driven, meaning those things, the brain prioritizes those um, uh, sensations that are coming in from the outside, so that everything that is threat-related captures you know, hijacks, entangles, whatever word you like. It captures and holds our attention. And if our executive function is not strong, that's not good news. This same monk told me that many years ago he was driving his motorbike to Hollywood Temple for a meditation. And uh, he was driving along and he became aware that there was a big concrete truck uh, not far behind him. And it was really following very closely uncomfortably close, he said. So by the time I got to the intersection of Sunset and Vine, uh, I thought, you know, I've got to do something about this. But he thought, if I, if I take a left on, whether it was Vine or Sunset, I don't know, that uh, he was turning onto, he said, it'll be safer, but it'll take me a lot longer to get there. Perhaps he would even have been late. And as he came to the intersection, uh, he could see it was a red light. And then he said, I just decided um, to get into the left turn lane, uh, and I didn't. Re and I knew I, I knew I didn't want to, but I but I, I just found myself doing it. He said, and the truck whistled past him, went straight through the intersection. Uh, its brakes had failed, and if he hadn't gone into the uh, left turn lane, he would have. Well, you can imagine. So, it was a really close call, and by. So anyway, he got to the temple without further um, um, uh, <laughs> issues. And he sat down and he, you know, he could still feel that his heart was racing a little bit. And so out comes Brother Bhaktananda. And so Brother Bhaktananda starts the meditation by saying, you know, in, in Brother's inimitable way, well, here we, here we all are for a meditation and whatever care, cares and worries we have, just throw them out. Uh, because Master is going to take care of them while we're here meditating. So whatever you feel worried about, just, just know Master is going to take care of it. And he said, Brother gave this, you know, I found it a very humorous um, um, analogy. He said, it's like you have a hen on a table and you don't let the hen walk off the table. You, like, you stop it from falling off the table. And he said, that's, that's how God is with us. And, you know, I mean, that's a far cry from a concrete truck without brakes. But uh, th this monk realized right away that huh, it's, it's like Brother Bhaktananda was talking directly to him. And he said he got this surge of like, wow, that's what happened. Master was looking after me. He said, I was so excited I couldn't meditate for the rest of the meditation. <laughs> so... Because that, that excitement was, if you like, a stress. It felt great and, and he loved it, but at the time he didn't have sufficient control over and, and ability to calm down the nervous system. And so, so threat and stress and moods, they're, they're interrelated. Sometimes it's hard to tease them apart, but they all have the same effect. So, now we have an idea of the scope of the challenge, okay? And how do we go about developing our ability to concentrate? Well, we know scientific techniques of meditation, but we might also be wondering, do I need to you know, cut out stress from my life? And our, our guru would say emphatically not, emphatically not. And Jaw's research, he did it with uh, some of it with the US military, and, and that, that bore out 
uh, in a, she was able to teach them uh, a form of mindfulness meditation, watching the breath, that had a measurable uh, effect on their ability to concentrate, and this is in a highly stressed um, cohort of individuals. And what she found out was some did, didn't do it at all. Some did it the recommended 30 minutes a day, but some did a lot less. And she said at first it was hard to uh, figure out what the results were telling us. But she realized you could really break it pretty uh, uh, in, a, in a way that would show your results into two groups. People that meditated less than 12 minutes a day, 12 minutes a day, and more than 12 minutes a day. Uh, or 12 minutes or more. And those that meditated or tried to practice this mindfulness for at least 12 minutes a day saw a, a noticeable and measurable improvement in their quality of life and concentration by just 12 minutes a day. Just 12 minutes a day in a highly stressed uh, group of individuals, as I've said. And, and this is exactly what our guru tells us in Lesson 23, which is understanding the purpose and spirit of meditation. He said, meditate even a few minutes a day, but go deep and make those minutes count. Do not be discouraged if it is not easy to meditate long in the beginning. Just keep practicing, extending the time a little more each day until, until you are able to sit long in meditation without even thinking of time. In other words, we start small, we learn to go deep, and then we go long. And, you know, if you're already uh, an experienced meditator and long-term yogi and uh, you've figured this out in whatever way, either by following the instructions clearly or in, through some meandering path, that's great. Obviously, we don't need to go back and start again. But I'm really talking to um, individuals that maybe have just started on the spiritual path and, you know, aren't quite sure how to put things uh, in the right order or how to go about it and for individuals that have a lot going on in, in their lives. It's more important to go deep um, and shorten the meditation if you have to, because it's not just a skill we're developing, but it's a habit. So keep those things in mind. Now, there's a few difficulties with, uh, that come up when we're trying to uh, watch the breath, which is part of Hong So, but it's part of many meditation techniques or concentration techniques techniques, mindfulness techniques. And um, I just want to touch on them briefly, but they're important because they come up for certain people. And the first thing, the first category I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe is weird stuff, okay? This, and, um, and, and so let me quote from the Gita on this. This is chapter 1, verse 12. Grandsire Bhishma, oldest and most powerful of the Kurus, with the purpose of cheering Duryodhana, Bhishma's ego, Duryodhana's material desire. Bhishma blew his conch shell with a resounding lion's roar. Then suddenly, verse 13, then suddenly, after Bhishma's first note, a great chorus from conch shells, kettle drums, cymbals, tabors, and cowhorn trumpets sounded from the side of the Kurus, or bad habits, etc. The noise was terrific. And our guru explains what's going on here. At the beginning, when, we, when we're sitting down and we're trying to meditate, ego consciousness is still awake, and he blows the conch shell of breath, and then the sense organs of heart and circulation and lungs make many peculiar thumping, throbbing, and purring sounds. He said, these are the other conch shells. Behind these are the astral sounds, but we can't hear them. And so the mind becomes discouraged and unsteady, a prisoner of its own sense-enslaved, and you could say attention-enslaved nature. And I was talking about this um, phenomenon uh, at an, uh, one of our other temples um, some, some years ago, and I, I asked them, the, the devotees, I said, you know, on your way out, if you, if you want to stop and tell me if you've, whether you've had any strange experience in meditation like this, you're trying to concentrate and then some strange things are going on to, to distract you. I mean, we know, we know the, the obvious ones, like maybe the back starts to hurt and it never hurted until we sat down to meditate. So I call this weird stuff. And what it is, it's just, uh, at the bottom, it's, it's just the ego trying to distract us. And what do we do about it? 
non-attachment and even-mindedness. Just, you know, allow these things to go on. As Krishna tells Arjuna about the, in the battle of Kurukshetra, uh, bear with it, O Indian prince, tis brief and mutable. What he, what he could have said as well, no doubt he did, was that it is only brief and mutable if we bear it with even-mindedness. If we don't, if we get upset about it or become afraid of these symptoms, then they tend to perpetuate. Another category is uh, we're told to watch the breath and we're supposed to watch it in a very calm manner, very accepting manner. But, and I know all about this, sometimes we get into the habit of watching it very intensely. And another author, in another context, referred to this as hawk mode, just watching the breath. And he said, uh, nothing about a hawk's burning gaze says safety. And if we're watching the breath like this, it's sending a message to the body and mind. There's a threat out there. And so we have to just watch it in a very calm fashion. And uh, sometimes uh, that can take, uh, that attitude can take time to develop. And, uh, and I certainly found that in my own case when I was starting to meditate, just trying to watch it too intensely. I had to develop uh, a visualization practice of visualizing myself meditating in a calm way. Because I had developed the habit of sitting down to meditate, getting tense, and then that was the habit. And every time I sat down to meditate, I could feel that tension. Then I visualized meditating without tension. Then I sat to meditate, and gradually I developed the replacement habit. And, and there's different ways to go about it. That's, that's one way that worked for me. And the third, the third category is more complicated still. And um, if, if we've had trauma in, uh, in some part of our lives, just watching the breath, we, you know, if, in our traumatic experience, we might have experienced certain feelings of suffocation and what have you that are very troubling. And putting our attention on the breath can reawaken, can re-trigger those experiences. So there's, there's different ways to go about this, many different techniques, um, affirmations, visualizations, and, and etc. But different things tend to work for different people. So if you're having trouble with that, I wouldn't hesitate to recommend finding somebody that can help you deal with that. So now we get to uh, two huge factors that affect our attention, and hopefully we can do something about them. Sleep and diet. We so often get this question from devotees new, new to the path. Should I reduce the amount of sleep so I have more time to meditate? After all, Master said in, in lesson one, six hours of sleep is sufficient for most adults who practice deep yoga meditation. And if we're wondering about cutting back on our sleep, we also need to ask ourselves, am I really meditating deeply? Enthusiasm is wonderful and necessary, but it's not enough, really. And we need to be really honest with ourselves here, because lack of sleep has, it's fair to say, a catastrophic effect on our ability to concentrate. And let me just tell you a couple of things that Brother Premamoy, he was the house brother of the postulants for decades, he told the postulants, get enough sleep. If you don't, you will have apathy for everything, including as to whether you even bother to meditate. And he also said, get enough sleep. If you don't, you will make up for it in meditation. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this is actually exactly what happens. There is a, a popular book came out a few years ago. Some of you have no doubt read it. Matt Walker's Why We Sleep. He's a professor of neuroscience. Um, up at Berkeley, and uh, the book was, if you'll forgive me, a real wake-up call about the perils of too little sleep. And adequate sleep, according to Professor Walker, could be anywhere from seven to nine hours, with the majority needing around eight hours. But anything less than that, unless you're one of a very, very small group of people that have a particular genetic quirk, and that's you know less than a fraction of a percent, in case you're wondering and you're thinking it's you, um, uh, anything less than seven hours uh, could, could, could be really putting you in, in some long-term troubles, and even not so long-term. And what happens is, if we don't have enough sleep, we get these things called uh, micro-sleeps. I had not heard about this. It's different from the mind just wandering. 
It's like the brain actually goes to sleep, or parts of it go to sleep. And we can tell this on attention tests. People are asked to hit a button if they see a light. And if they've had even, even six hours of sleep for, um, for a few days, which is not enough in, in Professor Walker's estimation, he said, you see, there are times when people don't even respond to the button. And they can tell, they're asleep. Often, they're, many times, the eye closes entirely or partially. But I think it can even happen with the eyes awake. Again, it's not mind-wandering, it's a different brain state, you're asleep. And apparently, individuals who slept eight hours every night maintained a stable, near-perfect performance across the two weeks of the experiment. This is you know, testing their attention. And 10 days of six hours of sleep a night was all it took to, became, to become as impaired in performance as going without sleep for 24 hours straight. And this accruing performance impairment showed no signs of leveling out. In other words, if the experiment had gone on for longer, their intention would have continued to crater. So, so, so really, um, getting enough sleep is so important. And are we sleeping enough? A good way to tell is whether we find ourselves needing to make up for sleep on, on the weekends. If we are, it means we're not sleeping enough during the week. And uh, you know, if we can, let's do something about it. But I always wonder, why is, why is the discussion always about sleep versus meditation? Um, you know, maybe I, I can just immediately reduce to six hours. Well, you know, there's other things we can do, like <coughs> Netflix. Um, but, you know... <laughs> Uh, I don't know why that is. People seem to think it's sleep and meditation. Get enough sleep, get enough meditation. If you're meditating deeply, yes, start to cut back, but, but just be careful. And it's not just attention. It's physical health and our emotional control as well. Deeply, are deeply affected if we don't get enough sleep. And another thing to, um, that we can do something about is, is our diet. And in particular, these so-called ultra-processed foods these days, which were not, not especially common in, in master's time, but have just become like omnipresent now, they really have an effect on, on our attention. And it's because of the sugar surges and crashes. And this is a real thing. It's not just like something people find on the internet. Uh, this is scientifically and medically credit, creditable. And the brain runs on glucose, unless we're fasting for a long time, then it runs on something else. But for the most part, the brain runs on glucose, and if the blood is not delivering enough glucose to the brain because we're, we have a sugar crash, then our attention is going to really, really suffer. So those are two things we can do something about. And uh, if, if, you know, in thinking about this, you think, yeah, I could be doing better here. <laughs> um, try it. Try it for three months. Uh, try improving uh, how you go about these things for three months, and then see. Then see how it affects the depth of our meditation. And one thing I haven't mentioned. I mean, many things I haven't mentioned. But you know, one thing I haven't mentioned: willpower. You know, what do we often think? If we're not able to concentrate, we think, oh, I just, if I could just try harder. I, I, I just need to try harder. And sure, there's, willpower is part of like, improving our habits and all that. But it's, and it's related in the brain. But it's really something different. And if we're finding that, you know, especially over time, that you know, we think we're doing it right, but we're just, you know, we're just not developing the ability to meditate. You know, think about these things I've said today. Um, because it's, it's, it's not that we're not good enough. It's not that we don't have enough willpower. I mean, maybe that's true, but we put, apply willpower in other areas of our life to support our efforts to meditate, because when we sit to meditate, that support is, going to, is, going to, is, is what will allow us to meditate and concentrate. You know, you think about the uh, chakras in the spine. I've talked about the brain today, but the different qualities are represented by different chakras in the spine. And self-control is uh, represented in Arjuna, so important. It's rep represented in the lumbar chakra. But attention, uh, his elder brother, the king, 
Yudhisthira, that's in the higher Vishuddha chakra. So they're separate, so keep them separate. It's not about willpower, it's about how we're, how we're living our lives and how we can optimize that to support our efforts uh, to, to concentrate and meditate. And I find this very encouraging, that there are real things that we can do that make a huge difference. So let me finish with uh, a quotation from our guru about the, the benefits of Hong So, and, and this is from Lesson 21. He wrote, or Guru wrote, while others are wasting their time in the feasting of the senses, you sit quietly and, whether alone in your room or amidst a throng or a crowd surrounded by the bustle of activity, practice Hong So. Fill every spare minute with Hong So. You have in your possession the key to heaven and earth. Falter not. With infinite determination, use that key of Hong So thereby bringing heaven to you in a very, very short time. Keep on. Hong So, Hong So, Hong So. Om, Om, Om. And you will be in your Father's home. So please stand, we'll have our healing technique. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent, Thou art in me, Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their bodies, minds, and souls. Now with arms upraised, let us chant Om for healing of the body. soul. And for world peace and harmony. Let's have our closing prayer. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Divine Mother, May thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion. And may we be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Om. Peace. Amen.